Hi friends, thank you for tuning in to the Concussion Coach Podcast. I'm Bethany Lewis, the Concussion Coach. I'm a neurological occupational therapist and certified life coach, and I specialize in guiding people through their concussion recovery journey. I am passionate about helping people understand their injury, speed up their recovery, and reclaim control over their life post-concussion. The purpose of this podcast is to help increase awareness of concussions and the impact they can have on a person's life, and to bring hope to people who have suffered a concussion and those who love them. I firmly believe that sharing stories and knowledge about concussions will bring important light and understanding to this misunderstood and often invisible injury. The information in this podcast is meant to bring that awareness and hope and is not meant as medical advice. The opinions shared are those of the interviewees and my own. If you are suffering with lingering concussion symptoms, I have created a concussion coaching program specifically for you. I will be your mentor to guide you through your recovery journey, offering help with understanding and managing your symptoms, setting achievable goals, and learning how to manage your own thoughts and nervous system in order to get control over your life again. If this program sounds like something that would help you or someone you love, sign up for a free consultation. In the consultation, you'll get valuable information and resources and gain hope for your future. Sign up for your free consultation at the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Hi friends, welcome back to the Concussion Coach Podcast. I'm excited for our interview today. I'm going to interview Zara Drino. Zara is an occupational therapist in British Columbia, and I came across her through an occupational therapy continuing education course that she taught. Her class really resonated with me, especially since she works with people who have concussions and chronic pain. So I looked up her social media account and have enjoyed the insights and tips that she posts regularly. I thought she'd be a great person to bring on the podcast to share her insights on concussion recovery. So I reached out to her and she was kind enough to come and share her knowledge and experience with us today. And here's a little bit more about Zara from the bio on her website. Having graduated from the University of British Columbia with a master's of occupational therapy and the University of Windsor with honors in psychology, focusing on neuroscience, Zara is now committed to patient-centered and evidence-based care that is holistic and filled with compassion. For her, nothing is more fulfilling than to aid in someone's recovery journey and witness them develop the skills they need to live their lives more autonomously. Sarah has worked with a variety of ages and populations and has developed a strong skill set in traumatic brain injuries, mental health, and chronic pain. When she's not practicing occupational therapy, Sarah can be found adventuring through the mountains, playing music, trying out a new cookie recipe, meditating, crafting, and volunteering, which are all things that I love. So I think we're going to be good friends. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here today, Zara, and for being willing to share your knowledge and insights with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So let's start out with hearing more about your background. Tell us where you're from and what got you interested in occupational therapy in the first place. Yeah, so I'm originally from Ontario and I was a neuro nerd since I was a kid. I was always really interested in the brain and how the brain works. And when I was 13, I was reading my stepmom's psych textbooks. So it was kind of just set up to be that way. And occupational therapy I sort of had a choice when I was finishing my undergrad if I wanted to do a PhD in neuroscience or if I wanted to do something else. And when I thought about, you know, sitting in a research lab all day, every day, it just wasn't aligned with my lifestyle. And I really wanted to be hands on and helping people and talking to people every day. So OT just seemed like a really good way to mix my love of neuroscience and to be talking to people and helping people. Fantastic. Yes, I feel the same way. It is. I love the brain. It is so fascinating. And OT is a great way to apply the knowledge of it. That's awesome. And you've chosen a pretty unique path as an OT by starting your own practice. I'm curious, how did that come about? And what do you enjoy about it? Yeah, so there's a few different kind of things that led into that. The specialization in concussions and chronic pain came from my love of neuroscience and then also from having a concussion, a pretty bad one when I graduated OT um, and also being in a, in a really bad horseback riding accident, which led to 10 years of chronic pain, which I ended up kind of healing myself through learning about pain and learning about how it's produced in the brain. And so I I took everything I knew and I started to make a TikTok about it. (laughs) Um, And that combined with my knowledge in OT and my knowledge in neuroscience, I just started, you know, giving a lot of tips about it. And then I found there was people from around the world who were really interested in working with me and understanding more about the things that I had to offer. And that led to me starting my own business. So um, I still work at a clinic and then I do my business on the side as well. That's awesome. What is the difference between the OT that you do and the coaching that you do? Yeah. So OT is sort of 
uh, within the college guidelines, it's very regimented into occupation focus. So focusing on meaningful activities, focusing on educating on very specific things and adapting people's environments and giving them aids and things like this. With the coaching business, I can um, expand a little bit more and I can practice outside of BC. So I can practice globally and I can focus a little bit more on other things like nervous system regulation and mental health, which I add a little bit into my OT practice, but it's, again, it's a bit restricted by the college guidelines. Perfect. Yeah, that's kind of been my experience as well. I, doing the OT, the occupational therapy side of things, there are certain restrictions and I can only practice that in Utah versus the coaching can be more expansive, but they're both fantastic <laughs> and really good tools in both. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you said you mentioned briefly what got you into brain injury and chronic pain. Um, do you want to tell us any more about your story with your concussion and horse riding accident? Yeah, so I had a couple different freak accidents in my life, which led to me having, yeah, like I said, chronic pain for 10 years. And then I had two different concussions. And it, it was sort of serendipitous having the concussion right when I graduated because it led me to have a lot of knowledge about concussion in my own recovery, which then helped me get an interview for the job that I got at a, at a neurological rehab center, which then helped me get way more knowledge in concussion. Um, so it's funny even that at the time, sometimes these things were like, I can't believe this just happened. It, you know, set me back so much in my life, but sometimes there's like little reasons and meaning that you can find in it, which I, which I really enjoyed in my own life. It really set my life in the right direction. Not that it always does that, but yeah. it was nice to have that experience so that I can relate to my clients better. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Kind of the blessings in disguise that are disguised by a lot of hard things. Yeah. Um, so oh. with that, was the, the horseback riding accident that main concussion that you had right after OT school? That was actually a boating accident. So it was kind of two separate things. Separate things. Did you have yeah. a concussion with the horseback riding as well? Or was that, that was more the chronic pain part? That was chronic pain. It was more of a hip injury. Okay. And I'm just curious too, with the concussion, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what are some of the symptoms, the main symptoms that you had from that experience? There was a lot of confusion and cognitive difficulty. I was recovering for about five months. For the first few months, I couldn't really walk or speak properly. I had a lot of energy deficit, a lot of headaches, and a lot of pain. I had also broken five of my teeth and my jaw, so there was just a lot of pain involved with it as well. But thankfully, I got a really good rehab team, and I had people who were very knowledgeable in concussion, and that makes a world of difference when you start from the very beginning, having the concussion and having a knowledgeable rehab team, then your outcomes are so much better. Yeah, that's huge. And a huge blessing to have that. What about for people though, who may have had a concussion, didn't have that right away and are finding out about what concussions can be now. There's things that can do to help them, right? Things that you can do. Oh, absolutely. When we think about prolonged concussion symptoms, there's usually four or five different things, systems that can be affected. Um, the brain tends to heal relatively quickly, but then these other systems down the line get affected. So if you know a practitioner who's aware of these things and can help you to treat those things, then you're going to get the right treatment. So, you know, there can be physiological alterations like blood flow and hormonal changes and things like that. There can be cervicogenic like neck issues that are contributing to dizziness or pain or headaches or vestibular, which is our balance system, ocular our eyes or alterations in mood. And if you can get a team or a clinician that can really assess for each one of those and see which one you have, and then help you to develop strategies or treatment for those things, then you're very likely to recover. It's a, it's a very recoverable injury if it's treated properly. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. That was very well put. And I think this next question kind of goes along with some of what you were saying. I think there were two courses that I took that you had done on occupationaltherapy.com for continuing education. And one of them focused on polyvagal theory. And I had heard about it in a couple places, but I enjoyed your summary of it. And so I was thinking it would be helpful for people to hear what is polyvagal theory and why it can be particularly helpful for people who've had concussions. Totally. So um, yeah, polyvagal theory is a theory that was developed in the 90s. I really like to emphasize that it's a it's a theory, so it's a really helpful framework. There are some criticisms of the theory with its sort of 
basis in biology, but I really like to look at it as a framework for understanding our symptoms and how our nervous system might be dysregulated. So in order to explain polyvagal theory, we can go into the nervous system a little bit. In our nervous system, we have uh, what's called the autonomic nervous system, which is basically responsible for all the automatic functions in our body, like breathing and heart rate and blood flow and digestion and things like this. And when we undergo something that's very traumatic, stressful, or we have a traumatic brain injury, that system can become dysfunctional. So we we call it dysautonomia, which is like a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And polyvagal theory is really helpful for understanding this because it's all about the nervous system. And it's all about the ways in which the nervous system tries to help us survive. So the autonomic nervous system is responsible for what we, most of us are familiar with the terms fight, flight, freeze, and fawn is the fourth one that some people might not be familiar with. So the autonomic nervous system kind of throws us into those states. So you can imagine that if it's dysregulated, then you might be in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn more than not. And that can create a lot of symptoms. It can create things like dizziness, like fatigue, headaches, anxiety, depression. And these are all very common symptoms after concussion. So when we can treat the nervous system using techniques that we think of in terms of polyvagal theory, then we can sometimes help with that concussion recovery as well. Awesome. Can you explain for people what those different like fight, flight, freeze and fawn mean? Yeah, of course. So in a survival situation, I like to use the example of like a lion jumping out at me because most people don't have a traumatic experience with a lion. If a lion jumps out in front of me, I have a couple options, right? So usually our brain will go through the safest option first. It's a bit like a ladder. The first option that's the most safe is for me to fawn the lion and fawning it is to give it something that it wants. So let's say I have a backpack on with snacks in it. I throw the snacks at it and I hope that it just goes after the snacks and not for me. So if we get stuck in the fawn response after some kind of traumatic event or traumatic brain injury, then we that can look like codependency and people pleasing and um, really just not listening to our own boundaries and our own sense of no. And we can use this as sort of a way to try and survive. The second safest thing for me to do is to run away, flight. So that gives me not very much interaction with the lion. So if I can run away from it, that's great. And if that gets stuck in our body, it can look like anxiousness and nervousness and weariness and avoiding things and panicking. And physically, it can show up like dizziness, it can show up like blood flow issues, a lack of digestion. And yeah, that can that can impact our lives in some pretty big ways. And then fight is the other option that we have. If we're starting to run out of options, we would try and fight it. And if that gets stuck in our bodies and our nervous systems, it can look like anger, it can look like frustration, we can have a lot of tension in our muscles, and there can be a lot of other physical symptoms associated with that as well. And then the last thing, if all those don't work, then we would freeze. And if you think about it, a lot of concussions happen, the majority of concussions happen in things like car accidents with whiplash. And in a car accident, you can't fawn the situation. You can't run away from it. You can't fight it really. So your option is to freeze. And so a lot of times with concussion, there's this energy deficit that happens in the brain. And then we might also on top of that, have a freeze response So we can end up with this, like this shame, this shutdown, this depersonalization, kind of like we're watching our life on camera and a sense of like extreme fatigue. So yeah, those are the survival responses. Interesting. And those fit into the polyvagal theory because that's kind of when the system is dysregulated, we tend to go into one of those survival systems and we can get stuck there. Is that the idea? Totally. So polyvagal theory, the way that they organize it, it's called polyvagal because we have this thing called the vagus nerve that runs from the base of our spine through all of our internal organs and all the way down into our pelvis. And in polyvagal theory, they basically divide the nerve in half where the top half, the ventral vagus nerve is supposed to be responsible for regulation and helping us feel calm and helping us feel like soothed and connected. And the bottom half is supposed to be responsible for the freeze response. Then our sympathetic nervous system, which is a little separate, would be responsible for fight, flight, and fawn. But 
when we look at the research is a little bit muddied on whether the vagus nerve is actually separated like that. The, the best research I could find shows that the freeze response is kind of a combination of the sympathetic nervous system, which is like our gas pedal and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is a break. So it's like you almost have your gas pedal and brake on at the same time. And that causes a lot of exhaustion. Um, so that's where the theory becomes really helpful, but it kind of breaks off from what we know in the literature. But I still think it's really useful to think about the survival responses and think about what might be happening in your body and how your body has adjusted to try and help you cope and help you survive. Because basically the amygdala, which is our fear center in our brain, goes, I'm in danger. And then after a traumatic event, it just keeps saying I'm in danger. And so it's producing these responses as if you're in a dangerous situation and need to survive when you're actually probably quite safe. You might just be laying in your bed and you might experience one of these responses. Yeah. So that's very helpful. Thank you. With your understanding of that, what tips or tricks do you have? I, I love, I think you share a lot of these things on your Instagram account, which is fantastic. And I'll link that in the show notes, but are there specific one or two or however many you want to do here tips for people who are feeling like their nervous system is dysregulated that could help them to come back to normal? Yeah, definitely. So we can go over a few of them. When we're thinking about nervous system dysregulation, we want to think about speaking the language of the nervous system because our limbic system, our emotional brain, our amygdala, the fear center, it doesn't speak English, right? So we can't just be like, oh, I have all this knowledge now and I know that I'm safe and I'm not in a survival like situation. So I don't need this survival response. I wish it worked like that, but, <laughs> but it doesn't. So we have these tools that we can use to kind of trick the nervous system into thinking that it is safe. So doing things that it would do if it was safe. One of the best ones that I know of, there's actually a study that just came out, like a 2023 study a few months ago. Dr. Huberman, who is this amazing scientist, I would listen to his podcast if I were you, he's amazing. You don't already. Um, but Dr. Huberman came out with this study in 2023 about the physio, it's called the physiological sigh. And basically what it is, is it's two inhales. And the second inhale is like a sip of air on top of the first one. And then a long exhale, like you're fogging up a mirror. You want to hold the exhale as long as you can, because a long exhale will stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. So it stimulates that rest, digest, and connect part of our nervous system. And the double inhale is important because it can offload more CO2, which can cue the body into a sense of relaxation. Um, and it basically we get a chance to inflate the alveoli as much as they will inflate so that they have an opportunity to offload that CO2. Is the first breath, like it's a deep breath and then an extra little like fill up the rest as much as you can kind of thing? Totally. Yeah. So it's like that quick inhale and then a sip of air at the top. So. And then let it all out. Okay. Slowly. <laughs> Slowly. Out. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. I have to say, I started listening to Dr. Huberman's podcast, um, the Huberman Lab, right? Podcast after your thing. And it is fascinating. There's so much good stuff there. So yes, absolutely recommend that. I will also include a link to that in the show notes. So thank yeah, you. He really dives into the weeds of everything and like what it means and, and the science behind it. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, it's definitely, definitely really interesting. Yeah. Another thing that I recommend that some people hate and don't want to do, but I think it is very powerful, is called the diving reflex. So the mammalian diving reflex, all mammals except for whales, I guess, have it, um, where if you dive into cold water, your nervous system will sort of just reset itself. It provides a lot of wakefulness. So if you find you're in the freeze response a lot, then doing this can help wake you up. And if you find that you're really in a panic or, you know, you're, you're, blood pressure and your heart rate's kind of going all over the place, this will kind of help to reset it. And we can do it a couple different ways. It's really useful to fill up a bucket of cold water and ice, and then you could just dunk your head right into the bucket, which again, sounds unpleasant. It is going to spike stress in the short term, but short term or what we call hormetic stress is actually really good for the nervous system. It's good for us to put ourselves intentionally into stress so that we can learn how to soothe ourselves when we're in a stressful situation that's not beyond our control. Because oftentimes stress just is beyond our control. And when we can actually know, hey, I chose to do this to myself and now I'm regulating, 
that can make a big difference. So you can dunk your head into the bowl, hold, hold your breath for as long as you can, or you can take a cold shower, or you can go into a cold lake. I would be cautious not to take this too far. You don't want to get hypothermia, so make sure it's not too cold. And if you're experiencing a lot of dizziness, it might not be safe to do it in the shower. So just be aware of that. That's really interesting because I would think that that would be something that would be helpful if you were like in a low state of arousal. So you're just kind of like, you're not feeling a lot. So doing something like that would wake you up. But it's interesting to hear that it's also helpful if you're kind of too heightened because it can reset it and help you get back. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, totally. It's kind of, it's kind of one, the two that I've provided are really good for all of the survival states where some of them might be good just for fight or flight or just for freeze. These ones are kind of universal. Um, I'd also recommend trying not to do it close to bed because it will spike cortisol because it's, like I said, it's hermetic stress. So if you do it close to bed, it could make you sleepy. Before bed, it's great to be in warm environments like a bathtub or something or a sauna. And then one of the last ones I'll, I'll review, like, like you said, there's a ton on, on my TikTok and on my Instagram, I have like, I think a 30 video playlist on TikTok that has a whole bunch of them. But as an occupational therapist, I really like to think about meaningful occupations and how they can regulate our nervous system. So often what I'll do with my clients, and I encourage you, if you're listening to this, to do it on your own is make a list of your triggers. So make a list of the things that bring your nervous system into that sense of dysregulation. And it could be certain people that you hang out with or activities that you do or things that you say to yourself or things that other people say to you. It could be a lot of different things. And then you also want to make a list of glimmers, which are the opposite of triggers. And this is where you can include activities that really bring you that sense of safety. So it's like, you know, when I'm swimming, I don't think about anything else or if I play my guitar, I feel really safe and I feel really good. Or, you know, if I cook a meal or whatever it is for you and using pacing within that, because when you have a concussion, it's important to pace yourself, but finding activities or even sensations. So like, you know, if I smell lemon, I feel activated, I feel energized, or if I have a hot chocolate, I feel soothed. Or if I put a weighted blanket on, I feel soothed. So you can think about your five senses you can think about activities, you can think about places you can go, people you can hang out with that help you to feel safe. And the whole idea is that we're just doing things that tell the nervous system that you're safe. Because you wouldn't sing or dance or play guitar or make cookies in front of a lion, right? Like, <laughs> so it's just being like, hey, nervous system, I'm doing this thing that means that there's no threat in my environment. That's awesome. And I like to more like on the psychological component of it, it's finding, you know, we tend to, when we're having a hard time, we tend to just focus on all those things that we can't do anymore. And so focusing on the things that we can do and that do still bring peace to us <clears throat> can be really beneficial, I think for yeah number of reasons, but that's, that's awesome. And if you guys want to hear more, definitely check out her TikTok and Instagram. And I was curious on your website, it said that you offer laughter yoga and hypnotherapy and I have never heard of laughter yoga before, and I'm vaguely familiar with hypnotherapy, but I'd love to hear about more of those, more about those, if you're willing and able to tell us <laughs> what they are and how they're beneficial for clients. Yeah, definitely. So laughter yoga is basically a series of exercises where you laugh for no reason, and we kind of just stimulate fake laughter. But the interesting thing in our brain is that it doesn't really know the difference between real laughter and fake laughter. And we've probably all heard like laughter is the best medicine. It truly is. When we look at the research around laughter, it is, it is just filled with really great benefits for reducing stress and managing our blood pressure and creating a lot of very happy chemicals in our body. So we can use that session of, of laughter. And usually it's done in a group setting to promote healing. So that's the laughter yoga side of things. And Wait, then hypnosis. Sorry, oh, totally. before you jump into that, I'm so interested in this. It reminds me of, you know, I've heard that uh, that if you smile, like if you hold a pencil between your teeth and make yourself look like you're smiling, that it that action automatically stimulates your brain to believe that you're happier. Like it can actually help make you happy. So that's interesting. It sounds like laughter is a similar thing. Like you don't necessarily have to be feeling like something's funny in order to get the benefits of it. 
super interesting and and interesting that the brain doesn't know the difference between like real laughter and fake laughter because the brain also doesn't know the difference between real threat and perceived threat <laughs> like our our bodies will respond yeah. if we're having you know if we we can have body response to being chased by a lion or worried about a test that's coming up or something like our body doesn't know the difference and responds the same way so that's really interesting that it similar thing with laughter apparently like funny things or not funny but our body is reacting that way super super interesting do you use actual like humor or do you guys just like laughing will stimulate other people to laugh or like how does how does it work yeah so we use um just kind of silly exercises so the, like a prompt for example might be you're on the phone and you're talking to someone who is just the most hilarious person in the world so we're all gonna start laughing now and then we'll, we'll pretend we have a phone and we'll just be like ha, 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 you know like and it seems very wild when you first start it and like in the first 15 minutes of class, people are usually very uncomfortable, <laughs> but by the end of class, people are laughing as if they were like very comfortable and very happy. And usually that's kind of the turnaround that we get. I've, I've not had very many people say that they didn't enjoy it or they couldn't get into it. Like after a while, those guards sort of come down and part of being dysregulated is having a very big guard up, right? So if we can learn different ways of bringing those guards down and doing things that are slightly uncomfortable. It's usually what it takes concussion recovery is like pushing ourselves into the yellow zone, I call it, of slightly uncomfortable, but not too uncomfortable. Then we're going to get benefits with our nervous system. Oh, that's awesome. I love that so much. Um, so do you, and you said you usually do it in groups. Is it like a, an ongoing thing? Like you, like people should, or it would be good for them to come every week, or do you recommend people laugh every day? Like what's the is there a prescription for laughter? <laughs> I mean, ideally we'd be laughing every day. Yes. Right. Um, and that can come through like listening to comedy podcasts or watching a funny show or talking with a funny friend, or you can follow along. There's laughter yoga on YouTube. You can follow along with videos on there. I have a bunch of videos that I did for the trauma research foundation on there. And then there's also classes too, that you can probably find either online. So like through Eventbrite or in your community, there's likely laughter yoga. It's, it's pretty global. That's really cool. Is the one that you offer virtual or is it in person? It's both. I do. I do both. I haven't done virtual ones in a while, but I, I might be starting them back up in the fall. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that. And I will let you talk about hypnotherapy now. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Um, so when we think about hypnosis, we think about like stage hypnosis, right? Like, you know, someone making someone cluck like a chicken or do something silly on stage. And hypnotherapy is a much different approach where we're basically relaxing someone to the point where they can access things that are in their subconscious mind. And when we can kind of go into the subconscious mind, we can change thoughts and behaviors and ideas and beliefs that we have. And often underlying a lot of our mood difficulties are our shame-based thoughts about ourselves or, you know, things that we're really beating ourselves up because we can't do the things we used to be able to do. So if we can go in there and kind of suggest, lightly suggest to the subconscious mind to think differently about yourself or to basically turn down the dial on the alarm system in the brain, which is causing maybe, maybe chronic pain or causing concussions because that alarm is just keep going, keeps going off saying, I'm not safe. I'm not safe. If we get to the subconscious level of the brain, we can say, actually I am safe and really feel it on a very deep level. So it can be a really powerful therapy for some people. And a lot of people are like, well, what if I'm not hypnotizable? I haven't met a single client that wasn't. I've had people tell me they're not, but really what it, the being hypnotizable means is that you can feel safe with that practitioner enough to let go. So I wouldn't even do hypnotherapy if I felt like the client was not trusting me or didn't feel safe with me and building that rapport and that relationship first is really important. But yeah, if you feel safe with somebody, it's likely that you'll be able to be hypnotized. That's really interesting. So, and I assume that one is one-on-one -on -one therapy. It's not a group thing, right? Um, I do it in groups sometimes. So I have done like virtual groups, but what I like to do is one-on-one -on -one therapy where we really customize it to the thoughts that you want to change and the behaviors that you want to change so that it's, it's highly customizable. 
Another thing that I want to mention in, in terms of concussion recovery is neurofeedback. So this is a device that you put on your head and it reads your brain waves and it feeds back to you in real time. In the case of the clinic that I work at on your phone or tablet. And basically what it does is it reinforces you positively with points in a game. Every time that your brain goes into a state of calm, relaxed, focused, or memory. So it's kind of like giving a dog a cookie. Every time it does something good, we're reinforcing the brain that we want it to be in this state. So it can be really beneficial for recovering from concussion because it can help with things like pain and with that nervous system dysregulation and memory and concentration and these things that are often problems for people with concussion. And so that one would be through the clinic that I work at. We can do it globally as well. We can send out the devices wherever anybody lives. So yeah, I can give you that information to put in the show notes as well. Perfect. Thank you. That's, I have heard very good things about neurofeedback. I've heard it can also be really helpful for people who have ADHD. I'm sure it yeah. can be helpful for a lot of things. And I'll just throw out here too, that on one of the previous podcast episodes, when I was talking with Kenny Hunsaker, he mentioned the brainwaves app that we use at my clinic. And that's kind of, it helps bring the person's brain into a specific state, basically. And it's, kind of automatic, whereas neurofeedback is doing a similar thing, but it's kind of training your own brain how to do it, which, so I think both of them can be really beneficial, especially for people who are having a hard time doing it themselves. And it's not even always a conscious thing, right? That's why neurofeedback yeah. is so helpful, right? You can see it on a screen or, you know, it's playing a game, but it's bringing that subconscious awareness, I guess, to regulate that. That's very cool. Thank you for bringing that up. So what are some of your favorite resources for learning more about either polyvagal theory or other brain nervous system related topics? You mentioned the Huberman Lab podcast, which I am really grateful that you mentioned because it is really cool. Mm -hmm. What else do you like to, where do you go to learn about it? Yeah, for concussions, I think the concussion doc is really great. Yeah, he has a lot of YouTube videos about concussion and a lot of podcast episodes about it. And then in terms of polyvagal theory, so books by Stephen Porges or Deb Dana would be excellent resources for that. Deb Dana even has like workbooks you can do. And if you listen to her audiobook, she has the most soothing voice ever. It's like so lovely. So I would recommend those things for concussion and for polyvagal theory specifically. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. All right. Anything else that you would like people to know about concussion recovery or how to deal with their symptoms, how you dealt with yours, anything else that we haven't talked about yet that you think would be helpful for us? I just want to reiterate that concussion is a recoverable injury and that as long as we can identify which system is affected and then treat that system, people are very likely to recover. I think it was a couple years ago, there's like a big concussion conference that happens every year in the world, the World Concussion Conference. And they had a whole bunch of doctors there talking about this idea, like, is concussion a fully recoverable injury? And I think like 90% of them agreed that yes, it is a fully recoverable injury with the right treatment. So if you get yourself in the right hands, then there is a lot of hope. And I know it can feel so awful when you're in the middle of that, but it doesn't have to be that way forever. Our brains are very changeable and capable of neuroplasticity. And there's a lot of hope for recovery. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that is one of the most important messages to get out there. That's part of why I started this podcast is because I want people to know that there is hope um, mm -hmm. and to keep going because it that's huge. That's so, so important. And it reminds me of other questions that I like to ask people, especially ones who have dealt with it specifically themselves. You've you've got both sides here. You've had one and you work with people who have them. What, what advice do you have for the people who love the person who's going through a concussion and mm -hmm. want to help them? Yeah, I guess first recognizing that invisible illnesses are really hard and, you know, that person might not always look like they're not doing well or might be, not be able to express that they're not doing well, but just kind of checking in with them, helping them to pace is really important. Like that's the number one thing that my clients have trouble with is learning how to pace themselves properly. So learning how to stop when their symptoms start. And once we get a hold of that, people start to recover very quickly. So as a person who loves someone with concussion, if you can create a system with them where, you know, you can kind of check in and notice where their symptoms are at and, and help them with pacing, that could be an amazing help. But yeah, just being sensitive to the fact that invisible injuries are really hard and, you know, they might need extra care, extra patience, extra love, extra support. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. And sorry, you brought this up, so I'm going to keep going with it. With the pacing, any overall advice? I know it's a very individualized thing, but how do you help somebody stop when they don't want to stop? <laughs> like, what what is pacing, and how can somebody do it? There's a few different ways that I approach pacing. Sometimes we do like a full point system, which is kind of like Weight Watchers. You have like a certain number of points per day or a certain number of spoons, and then you can use those numbers. And it's very complicated. Um, what I'll get into to, today is a, a simpler system, the green, yellow, and red zones, basically. So a green zone is when you're doing an activity and you're not feeling any symptoms or you're not doing an activity at all. Yellow zone is when you're getting into your symptoms. I say like, two points on a 10 point scale increase. So yellow zone is like, maybe you started your walk and you're at four points out of 10. And then the yellow zone would be within that four to six zone, right? Within two points of where you started. Red zone is when you're getting three points or above your symptoms, just keep going up and up and up. What we want to do in general for concussion recovery, and this is not, people have kids, people have lives, you know, it's not, it's not always easy to do this, but trying to avoid the red zone as much as possible and stay in that yellow. So when you notice what I usually have clients do is write down before they do an activity that they know is typically triggering, like maybe going and checking emails or going for a walk or whatever it is, they'll write down their symptoms. Let's say again, four out of 10. And then every five to 10 minutes, you check in with yourself. And if you notice your symptoms have gone up by two points, you have to take a break. It's break time. Um, so sometimes clients might set an alarm on their phone to check in with themselves, or they might have somebody else remind them to check in, or they just kind of remember to check in. And if it goes up by two points, it's really important to take a break, to do some nervous system regulation techniques, to do some stretching, close your eyes, ground yourself, and see if you can bring those symptoms back down. And if you can't, it might be time to stop the activity. So that's kind of one part of pacing. There's a lot of other things involved, but that's the simplest way. And it's usually the first thing that I describe to clients. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That is key for so many people. And I think not only just like concussions, but chronic pain, all of the things, right? It's a very useful tool. And it does require being in tune with your body and recognizing where you're at. So that's also a, a good practice to get into just on a regular basis is tuning in to your body, knowing where you're at. So thank you very much for that. All right. Well, this has been so helpful. I think you've shared some really golden nuggets for people. And if they want to hear more from you or work with you, where can they go? Yeah. So you can reach out um, Uplift Virtual Therapy on Instagram or TikTok. UpliftVirtualTherapy.com is my website. And, and that's for pretty much everything that I talked about, except for neurofeedback. If you're interested in neurofeedback, that's through the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic. So it's snpc.tech. And that's where you can reach out for neurofeedback. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you coming today and bringing all of your knowledge and expertise. And I think the things that you shared will be really helpful for a lot of people. Thank you so, so much. You're so welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad you listened in today. I hope you have gained some helpful insights and inspiration regarding dealing with and recovering from concussions. My goal is to create more awareness and education about concussions and the fact that there is so much that can be done to improve life after someone has had one. Help me spread the message by liking, commenting, rating, and subscribing to this podcast and share it with others who would benefit from hearing it. There are more resources available on my website. And again, if you or someone you love would benefit from concussion coaching, sign up for a free consultation using the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Thank you. See you next time and take good care of that amazing brain of yours.